Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for a very, very special edition of Social Flight Live. We have two very special guests tonight. We have Jack Pelton, CEO and Chairman of the Board at EAA, and we also have Mike Adamson, President of the Aircraft Electronics Association. So very, very cool things. And of course, we are going to include in that uh, other things happening, including this little project behind me. We'll peek in on that. and We'll talk about some other things that are actually going on. So I'd like to start, I'm gonna bring up um, uh, let me share this very quick. There we go for our social flight live. And I wanted to uh, reflect again for everyone that's that's joining us that we are here to support general aviation and we're here to support you, both the industry, the FBOs, the restaurants, everybody involved at any part of that spectrum. And so stay in touch, send us your questions. A recording of tonight's presentation will be available on our YouTube channel. That's just searching for one word, social flight on YouTube. And you'll be able to find us, find other programs, find information about our build, lots and lots of other information. And since of course, these days, so many of us are kind of cooped up uh, at home, it's a great resource for getting lots of uh, education and, and ways to help with your own projects at home if that's something that uh, you're able to do, or your own flying as well. Uh, in addition to that, you can post questions. Uh, it is, uh, we'll do our best to try to field some of those questions with our guests during the show, but there is a Q&A feature uh, within this product that you're using for the webinar, and that will uh, allow you to post them there. If we do not get to your question, we'll do our best to do it following the broadcast. Now, um, Another thing I'd like to talk to you about, I, I showed a couple of these pictures at the last version of Social Flight Live, and I got some requests to do it again, kind of as, as inspiration. We took a, a, a currency flight, my son, and uh, one of my two boys and I, um, a little over a week ago, where we went up to Newburyport, uh, Massachusetts, to, uh, to try some getting in and out of a short strip there at Plum Island, and we flew at twilight, and I have to tell you, it was one of the most wonderful experiences that I have had since this crisis started. Um, it really was fantastic because uh, if we go to the beginning of it, when I first called up and, and talked to FlightWatch, I was concerned about what restrictions, are there any uh, TFRs, is there anything else, what's happening that I need to know about? Now here in Massachusetts, it is uh, still certainly legal to go to the airport, legal to fly, even uh, given the essential businesses and other social distancing rules. So as long as safe social distancing is being practiced, there's nothing here that prevents you from doing that. Now there is a request from the government saying that if you uh, go out of state, anyone returning back from another state should be self-quarantining themselves for 14 days. Uh, except for essential workers that are coming back and forth for commuting purposes. Now, uh, because of that, we did not leave the state during our flight. But it was really interesting because when I talked to Flight Watch, the feedback that I got was they were really happy actually to hear from us, uh, to hear from pilots. And they said there's no flight restrictions that they're aware of related to this that they've been dealing with. Um, they're here and they're happy to take the calls and they want to see flights happen. When we took off, what was really amazing is that, you know, even from just say 3,000 feet, the world has not changed from that view. And so it was almost as if someone said, how do you like to take a couple hours and leave all of this stress and everything that's happening around you behind? Go to somewhere where it's not happening. And that's what we experienced. It was so peaceful and so inspiring to do this. The controllers were absolutely wonderful. They were thrilled to hear from us, help us with some practice approaches and things like that. Um, other pilots that were up were doing similar things and it was really just a, a very positive and inspirational experience. And so I do want to encourage people as long as it puts no one at risk to enjoy the flying that they can during this crisis. Um, and that's, of course, very important. And in general aviation, so much of what we do already involves the basic tenets of social distancing to begin with. A lot of pilots fly alone uh, or only with immediate family that they're living with anyway. And I will say that all of the restaurants and FBOs that we talk to 
have already in, uh, put in systems for a very safe social distancing and no contact delivery, whether it's food or fuel or anything like that. So our world has evolved to this, um, and it's up to us, I believe, as participants and pilots to take advantage of that, to help support the community, um, to help keep our own spirits up and keep all of this going, and help currency as well. Because I have spoken with the FAA, and there is no current uh, talk that, that I've had from the folks that I've talked to about relaxing currency requirements for pilots. And I think that's important. We'll talk uh, with Mike later on about that. But um, that's, uh, uh, that, that, you know, it's important that we're current, uh, especially if uh, we are called upon by other people to transport supplies or to help in any way with a relief effort. So just a couple pictures and things to show you about that. Um, another thing, of course, we have our takeoffs for takeout program, which is, uh, again, helping to support airport restaurants and FBOs that are open for business during this time. And uh, this week's featured one is a gentleman, Carl uh, Kleiderer, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, from Carthage, North Carolina, sent us this trip that he took just last week. He said uh, it was very easy to observe safe social distancing. Um, everything was set up for it, and they were able to almost uh, take themselves away from uh, this, uh, uh, what we have, and enjoy a little bit of normalcy in the world by participating in general aviation. So with that, I'd like to introduce our, uh, our guest. Our featured guest for tonight is Jack Pelton. I'm going to first go and get him uh, turned uh, his camera started over here. Now, uh, Jack is the CEO and chairman of the board at EAA. Uh, Jack is the first elected chairman from outside of EA's founding Pavarenzi family of their of EA's history. And, and as that leader of that organization, um, its mission, growing participation in aviation, inspiring people to fly and build and further engage in flight. And it, it really cannot be understated. I'm honored that Jack is able to join us this evening. Um, he's a personal hero of mine, uh, a lifelong passionate aviation enthusiast. I mean, uh, his he started with his father at Chapter 1 of EAA. I'll ask him. We'll talk about that a little bit. And of course, holds airline transport, commercial certificates, uh, it, it, all sorts of aircraft, all the way up to Cessna, uh, Cessna Mustang jets. And of course, is the retired chairman of a small aircraft company we might know uh, by uh, the name of Cessna as well. Um, past chairman of Gamma, uh, served on boards including the Smithsonian, National and Air and Space Museum, NBAA, Corporate Angel Network, and, and more awards than I could possibly uh, list here. But I think really important to mention that you, uh, uh, he is in the Kansas Aviation Hall of Fame um, and as well has received, of course, EA's highest honor, the Freedom of Flight Award. So with that, um, I'd just like to welcome you, Jack. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Thanks, Jeffrey. It's great to uh, to be on. So let's start with, with the in, in inspiring part, really, I think, of your story. If you could tell us a little bit about your history and how someone gets through all of these achievements um, to where you are today. I mean, I've been going to EAA now for almost three decades. And, uh, and so to me, you're at the pinnacle of aviation. Yeah, it's certainly a great place to be and, and a great way to finish off a career. But, you know, and, and I had no no idea that this is where it would come full circle to because Tom and I were very close friends and had a lot of uh, a lot of great relationships in supporting EVA, but of course never never knew that work there. Um, it's really the result of just falling in love with aviation at an incredibly young age. Uh, my dad served in the U.S. Army Air Corps and, and learned to fly in Orion PT-22. And he would, growing up, we'd hear lots of the stories about learning to fly. Um, I actually named my son Ryan after the airplane, and I actually own a Ryan PT-22 that was from the same airfield that my dad soloed in. So it's it's kind of come full circle. And early on, I knew I wanted to be involved in aviation. I just didn't know how I was going to be involved. Um, I went to work out of school at Douglas Aircraft, uh, went on to Dornier Aircraft, and then, of course, Cessna. Um, I thought I'd probably be a pilot, that I would probably be an airline pilot, but you know, Vietnam era was coming to an end and there was a surplus of pilots. So I just stayed involved in the aviation and in the industry itself. Mm -hmm. My mother, my mother in 1942, when, actually 45, when my dad was, was in the Army Air Corps, they got married, they were high school sweethearts and she learned to fly. And so as, as a family, 
we spent a lot of time at airports and air shows and in Southern California where I was raised. Uh, chapter one out Flay Bob certainly was a was a important part of part of my life uh, in getting acquainted with aviation and all the various aspects of it. At, of all the kids, I was the only one that got involved in aviation and actually became a pilot, which is rather interesting. Really, out of uh, your whole family, yeah, there, family of four siblings, I was the youngest, and um, <laughs> as my sister would put it, put it, we spent all our family vacations at air shows and all that. I didn't want any part of that when I got older, so <laughs> I guess I could kind of understand. I wonder if that means that that uh, with uh, some of the maintenance and all the other tasks that ended up being done by the other kids, they got burned out on it, and you were still able to uh, uh, able to enjoy it. I, I just think they didn't see the romantic side of it. I mean, there is nothing, as you said in your opening monologue, about the getting up and looking down at the earth and seeing it from a whole different place and a whole different perspective. And, and I know all of my friends who are you know, majority of them are aviation nuts like myself. You know, we all talk about during this time that we're in right now, as to, I just want to get out of the airport. I want to go up for an hour, do some touch and goes, go look around and, and just kind of get the world out of my head. Have and you been able to do that? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I certainly have. This is, uh, I think we're on week number three at the stay at home uh, order and quarantine. So um, I, like you, I, I go out to the airport in the evenings after work and uh, everybody there is good about social distancing. And it's just me and my air. I fly, I usually fly this time of year, my Stearman, which is a, you know, beautiful evenings in Kansas where it's nice and warm and, and uh, clear my head and push the airplane back and say good night to her and, and head back home. Yeah. You know, there's there's so many reasons, I think, to 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 get out there and fly. I, I think people feel comfortable talking about uh, doing it for uh, safety reasons or to uh, help if, if they're on certain missions. But I actually really believe that there is such a value to seeing that that steering you're talking about pushed out of the hangar. Um, you think about we, we talk so much in general aviation and EAA is so dedicated to young people and getting them involved in, in aviation and inspiring them. What a wonderful time to help inspire people, even if it's just that that kid stuck in his backyard who hasn't seen his friends in three weeks, who all of a sudden sees this gorgeous steerman go buzzing over the treetops. I mean, that's... I, but I, I think one of the things we need to help promote, though, is it's okay. I mean, I have so many friends that they we have these little conversations amongst ourselves as to, uh, I want to run down to the airport and get my cub out, but I feel kind of guilty and I'm not sure. And, and I think it's, we just have to accept this. It, it's okay. You know, we don't, this virus thing should not cause your life to stop. And so right. things in a safe manner, to your point, staying current and doing the things that we should be doing. Life's too short. Get out there and enjoy it. I totally agree. You know, when we were talking with, uh, we had Jolie Lucas on as a guest, uh, aviation's, um, uh, a psychotherapist who, who does a lot of work with pilots. And one of the things that she brought on that, that seems to be driving a lot of this is almost this, this cumulative community-wide sort of uh, pervasive form of like uh, it being not okay to, uh, to enjoy life during this time, that it's somehow disrespectful. Like, because we're not putting people at risk. We're not, there's nothing that's actually happening that is an issue. I think the people that, if there are people who are concerned about that, I, I think those people are really thinking of it more in terms of whether it's respectful during a crisis to still enjoy your life. And I would argue like you, it's more important than ever during a crisis to enjoy your life. It is. And, and you know, going back to the, the growing up in aviation, one of the things for me personally that was very important in, in, in kind of forming my value system and my work ethic and different things was what the training of learning to fly did for me. Being growing up around it, you know, strictly recreational, we had a small little Cessna 140A that my dad had, um, and, and going through the process of understanding the, the, the science behind it, the discipline of, of learning the, the FARs, the taking the tests, the staying current, the checklists, all of that, I think personally really helped me as a young person to keep me centered on on course otherwise I think I would have been at the beach surfing every day so it, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's great discipline uh, it, it, it causes you to have to do critical thinking you have to be planning it's, it's just a lot of things that for me gave me a lot of disciplines that I could apply later in life and business that I think were, were really very important and foundational it's an excellent, excellent point. My uh, the older uh, of my two boys that'll be on the show a little bit later, Jake, is about was about to take his check ride when everything got shut down, 
and so he's right there. And so um, he has been studying daily for his oral exam. And I listened to the, and the questions are now becoming so um, into such minutia that I'm like, Jake, like there's, there's no way that he's going to analyze a power curve with you and see if you are at the most efficient point on it with your fuel flow. Like, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Good for him. Exactly. If we can only get those uh, flight schools back to a safe and operating position, maybe we'll finally uh, get that going. Yeah, what's the status in your part of the woods? I understand Maryland. Yeah. Uh, uh, perfectly legal for us privately to fly, but uh, flight schools themselves are, are currently shut down. Well, hopefully in the coming weeks that'll, that'll get reversed. I hope so. I really do. You know, one of the interesting things on one of our earlier shows, um, we uh, had Mark Rubin on from uh, New England Aircraft Detailing, who's an expert in disinfecting aircraft and protecting them from the virus. And it was fascinating that there are some products that they use that they actually uh, can coat the aircraft with, can fog the interior of the aircraft with, that will prevent virus transmission for up to two weeks on wow. hard surfaces. And so there are things in place that make it possible uh, once the the risk level goes down a little bit uh, to even have things like that type of aircraft use done. So I really hope that people will will embrace that. They will. I and mean, it's going to go back to some level of whatever the new norm will be. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about, so the help me understand. So you were with your dad in chapter one all the way out in California. Tell me about the, the movement, like from California to Wichita to uh, where you are now. Uh, yeah, I um, I live all the half over half of my life in Southern California, born and raised. Worked in Long Beach at Douglas Aircraft in Long Beach for 21 years. So you know, born and raised, grew up there. Went to work there in the aviation industry. Went to school there. Um, then went to when Boeing bought Douglas Aircraft. Um, I was given the opportunity. It was one of those kind of questions as to, we were kind of Avis and <laughs> Douglas and Boeing was hurt. So when number one buys number two, where you, it gives you pause to say, what do I want to do career wise? And I got offered the opportunity to go to Germany, to Munich, Germany, actually over Pfaffenhofen to Dornier Aircraft mm. and run, run flight tests and engineering at, uh, at Dornier Aircraft, which I did for about three years. And then Cessna recruited me out of there uh, to come back to the States, to Wichita, Kansas. And, um, I had never been to Kansas. Uh, I was strictly a California guy, and I came home one night and said, "Boy, I got this wonderful opportunity." My wife, so my wife, saying uh, to go to Kansas, and she's like, "I got to get a map out. Where's Wichita, Kansas?" <laughs> so we've been here 20 years, and uh, we still have our residence here in, in Wichita and our hangars, and then we have a place up in Oshkosh. And then when I retired from Cessna, I got asked to join the board at EA in uh, January of 2012. And then at the end of the year, they were having some serious issues and asked me to, to step in and be chairman and, and run the organization as a volunteer for three years. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And then in 20, 2015, I said, I'm, I'm either out, I got I to gotta get out of here. I mean, I can't, I can't be a full-time volunteer forever. I need to get on with retirement. And uh, they convinced me to stay. So <laughs> They said, how about we switch that from being a volunteer so that uh, that, that whole retirement thing, that can... Is yeah. that really retirement when you're involved in aviation? There's not. Well, the, the funny part was I, my wife and I were talking about, hey, in 2012, it'll be our first air venture where you're not either in the Cessna booth or I, I, you know, I spent years and years there as an exhibitor, um, always working. And we said, guess what? We're going to be able to sit in chairs on the flight line, watch the air show, uh, leave when we want to leave, come when we go. And it has not happened since. So, <laughs> you know. I, uh, you, you did get one year of that? No, I didn't because I, I was going to say <laughs> I got put on the board that year and never got to do that. But you know, it's been it's been really fun. I think uh, you know, opportunity to have been on the other side as an exhibitor and a sponsor and a donor, and then be able to come in and help EA. And having been in aviation business, it's it's been. I think I've been able to provide some uh, skill sets and things that they they needed, and be able to give a perspective that they probably did not have. And I'm so proud of the team we have. They're, they're doing such great work and we've expanded our programs and our reach. Uh, we're, we're getting in front of people with, with programs we've never had before. We had, it, it, there was always an argument on the board. Are you a air show with a, an association or are you an association with an air show? And I think we've really turned the corner to where our year round offerings are getting to be so strong that we have become an association with an air show. 
and we've got so much more to roll out in the next year. This little brief intermission, we'll call it, a summer break with uh, the, the uh, coronavirus is kind of getting in the way of some of that. But we've got so many exciting announcements to make on more youth programs and more initiatives and, and more ways to reach out to young people where they live. And I'm very, very excited about that. Yeah, uh, you really do. And and again, I, I've been, like I said, near about almost 30 years uh, going to Air Adventure and being a member uh, of EAA and uh, seeing the evolution of that. And I would certainly agree with you that it is very much uh, transformed into an association that has an air show versus uh, it may have been a little bit more like the reverse in the past. And some of those programs are are, are wonderful. I mean, we use uh, on on the aircraft behind me that that's being built here in our, in our house. You know, we use a lot of input from EAA stuff. We use software that's available from the program that you've got uh, that 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 allows you to do the the cam and uh, can and all the CAD work. It's absolutely. Um, absolutely wonderful and the the knowledge base of course that's there is fantastic and years ago um uh, i actually you know wrote at sport aviation so i mean i've had a lot of ties and i really do love the, the direction that the entire organization has taken and as you said it's done with just a, a, a fantastic cast of of individuals uh, that are located all over the place yeah, we, you know, we're so proud of, of our Young Eagles program, which was so important when, when Tom created that. And we've been able to fly along a lot of kids. But the team internally, we, we asked ourselves the question, that's been really successful and it allows a young person to have that first experience of flight. But how do you stay engaged with them through the life cycle of when they take that flight at eight, to when they become eligible age-wise to be able to go learn to fly? So we needed to put a lot of programming in place to do that. Right. Um, you know, we have the the software that as you can get free as a member that you can download to be able to have your own flight simulator at home. SolidWorks, which you talked about, yep. the CAD program. Um, webinar series, which are really starting to take get a lot of traction. We had a webinar the other night on, I think it was a Mike Bush seminar on, on engine cylinder overhaul. We had over a thousand attendees that night. Wow. Um, set out the, the system. And we're doing more of those. Um, our Ray Scholar program, which we're handing out a hundred, hundred ten thousand dollar a year scholarships that will take a young person in a chapter, um, all the way through to getting their license. And and wow. we partner with AMA and we're doing radio controlled airplane builds in chapters and and learning to fly those. But our goal is to keep the kids engaged with all those activities that we used to have access to, and we've got to do that in a new way. We can't do it like when I was a kid, you just pedaled your bike down to the airport, hung out. And, bummed rides and, and filled airplanes with fuel and, and you got enough money to get a license. But we want to have things, you know, whether it be on their iPad or in their computer right. or in the education system, uh, which AOK is doing a great job with the high schools and getting education out to right. the school system. We're going to get it out through a, a what we're calling Aero Educate, which we're going to probably unroll later this year, which will be web-based and be accessible by young eagles, their parents, the teachers in the local area, and the chapters. Uh, to give them curriculum and things that they can actually go work on. Yeah, I, and I mean, it's so important, of course, to find, to be able to get people and and reach them at all those different points in their in the age continuum, because it, you can inspire them. I mean, you know, my kids grew up at Kid Venture. We've been there every single year, and uh, you go all the way through. Kid Venture, one of the most special things ever. I oh well, yeah, well, I had. I was aware of it and saw it, but I finally had a chance a couple of years ago to take my oldest grandson through it. And you don't really understand the impact that it has until you take a young person going project by project through there to where they get the accomplishment of changing brakes on a wheel, doing a propeller, doing a rib, and coming out the other end, really believing in themselves and having learned something and feeling very special about now being a part of the aviation world. And it, it is really a gem. And yeah. what we're, we're going to do um, we are building an addition onto our museum. And the, the second floor of that addition will have those kind of labs, learning labs, hands-on maker rooms and spaces similar to Kid Adventure. So we can do that year round. So kids oh, can wow. come to Oshkosh year round and get that experience. And then on the first floor, um, we're gonna have our flight proficiency center, which if you go to Air Adventure and just off the plaza, we have the simulator center, which is open. Um, all week long where you can come in and train with CFIs on Redbird simulators. We're going to open one that's going to be open year-round in the museum on the first floor. Wow. So 
uh, a big expansion, big opportunity. But again, it's those those how you reach people 365 days a year, not just one week in July. Exactly, exactly. And and I think it's important to again, like you said, reach them also all the way through that life spectrum or their interest spectrum. And so that can be the the life spectrum aspect of it. Of we not only can foster kids at a very young age and then also help them with your programs of, of the Ray scholarship programs and get it all the way to a license, but also pick up people who maybe didn't have exposure to aviation. I mean, I had zero exposure to aviation until after college. And then at that point, how do we help those people who are now coming into maybe just a little bit of discretionary income, but not enough to really go the whole way, but have interest or how do we show people that they could uh, uh, use it for their business, that they could do other things. I think that's an opportunity and you've done work in that area as well, kind of all the way through so we don't have any lost generations or lost gaps uh, of people. Um, and I think that's that's very important. It is, we, you know, you, you need to help us because your story is a great one because you didn't have that introduction to it at a young age. I, I, have, I have to be careful because I was around it since I was a kid. And so and I, for, think, I, I think that's actually very important uh, because we and, and my own family now has a benefit that the generation in my family didn't have before because it, like you said, I've, I live and breathe it and, and that means my kids have never known anything other than when they were three months old being toyed around and having little blue headsets, you know, and, and all the things and all the pictures in their house of them, infants, you know, sleeping in headsets. And um, that's not, that's normal for us. That's right. not normal for the rest of the world. And uh, I was very, very, very fortunate through mentors. And that is really, I think, one of the most important things as an industry that we can do because our industry is set up for mentorship. To become an IA, you need a mentor. To become, You need instruction. You need people. And we even have programs that essentially are apprenticeship based in the industry itself. And, and so I think that that's the opportunity because I wouldn't be a pilot and wouldn't be where I am today if it weren't for bumping into someone at work who was the quintessential general aviation pilot, meaning nothing about their experience, just meaning that when they heard I might be interested in it, they wouldn't stop talking <laughs> until I went with them and then learned about it. And they wouldn't stop talking until they got me to take a lesson. And then like that was the rest of it. And it's those ambassadors, I think, that help make it happen. I wouldn't be an AMP or an IA if it weren't for getting an, getting an air, my first aircraft and then talking until someone said, you need to do this. You need to actually, it, it, you don't bump up against the FAA's rules on what you can do, what you can't do. Go the next, go the distance, get the hours, learn that you can do it. And I didn't go to a school to get my uh, AMP and IA. Um, it was all through that apprenticeship concept. So I'd love, love to see more and more uh, growth out of EAA in those areas as well. And we do need to focus more on all aspects of aviation besides just being a pilot. Um, the, the aviation careers that are out there for A&Ps and AIs and technicians, it's just fantastic right now. And, and will continue to be even after we get through this, this little hiccup here. Um, you, but when you get your June issue of Sport Aviation, I want you to make sure you read a column by Jim Bush because you are going to be the, the beta tester on a program that, that we've Jim has really thought through on membership, which is people who are passionate like you that that came through and, and be, you know self-made in that regard, but leaving a legacy of bringing other people into the EAA and and kind of a challenge out there to to see how many people can you go out and reach and, and get them as excited about it as you can. So make sure. And read that article. I will absolutely read that Jim Busha article and that is it that is a passion of mine. I you know again I got when I got involved in it I was off to the races. The first and when I decided to you know leave the, the industry I was in and go straight into uh, to uh, aviation myself it was all using what the men, what I'd gotten from all those mentors. I came out first with the educated owner video series saying well if I can own an airplane anyone can own an airplane. I'm going to teach people how to do it. Um, teach people how how to they can do it at whatever economic level, and then it led all the way to where I am uh, now with social flight. So I I would love to read that. I'd love to help in any way possible because that's what we are as an industry, and that's why we're here tonight is to inspire people and keep them going and build our ranks because it's such a wonderful wonderful place to be. And and we we have to share those stories because it it is accessible. 
if you look at flying clubs, you look at chapters, you look at, there are so many ways to have access to aviation, but uh, you yeah. know, beyond buying a, a brand new Cirrus, which is not affordable for most people. So you're um, absolutely right. The, 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 some of the most inspirational people that I have met have been at the lower income levels in, in that. I remember uh, a gentleman at my local airport had an air coupe that he did all the work on himself. He was a retired uh, guy from one of the airlines from a long, long time ago from, from the maintenance side. And uh, this, this was a guy whose car could barely run, but that air coupe kept going. And man, he just flew the heck out of that thing. And I, I, I can't imagine that uh, he spent more in his aviation pursuit than most people spend just on their car. Mm -hmm. We have a, a, cha a vintage chapter up in Gardner, Kansas that has a bunch of, of young career guys, who guys and girls who, who have young families. And, you know, they own Luscombs and they own T-Crafts and they own Champs and they partner together and they bring their kids and their young families out there in their 30s and 40s. And they have figured this out, that it's it's doable. And the the, the social aspects that they have, they, you know, they're, once a week they're out there with a sheet on the side of the hangar watching movies with their kids. And it's it's just fantastic. Yeah, it's absolutely wonderful. So I'd, I'd like to pivot for a moment and let's talk about, obviously, um, unfortunately, we are in that hiccup of a crisis. Um, and EAA has been doing quite a bit during this. I know you tell, tell me about hops and props. Tell me about some of the other things going on at EAA. Well, the hops and props didn't go on. <laughs> the, uh, right. The, the they, donation that occurred because of it. <laughs> the, the, we, every, it was all refundable. The, uh, we did a, a wonderful thing of giving back the, the food that was there for the, to the local community uh, shelters that needed it needed so so desperately. You know, this time of year, I would be talking to you and, and going through the entire lineup of AirVenture and all the great stuff you're going to come see in July. And instead, I'm going to give you the kind of the where are we in the process of even getting to July. Um, we had to, under the Wisconsin uh, stay-at-home order, everybody had to start working at home. And the, the team did an unbelievable job of figuring out how to keep the thing going. Uh, we are our membership center. They, they're working on their phones from home. Our IT department had everybody working and operating efficiently. Um, they haven't missed a beat. So if you if you were calling into EA, you would probably not know that there isn't a headquarters full of people. And we're still working on planning of, for the show. That decision, which is probably going to be closer to the May May time frame, is a very difficult one for us. And there's a, a few integral pieces of it that will kind of guide us into what we can or can't do in July. First of all, the virus. What's the situation with the virus at that point in time? And what type of mandates will be in place? What type of uh, requirements that we can ensure to our members, to the guests that come here, to the exhibitors, a safe and healthy environment. That has to be paramount. We have to protect uh, the crown jewel of their venture of not becoming tainted as a as a venue that it has some kind of risk to it. So we're really looking carefully. I meet with my leadership team every day, every morning. We start the day with what you hear yesterday and what's going on and, and what's the situation with our volunteers. Uh, what's the situation with our exhibitors? What's the situation in the, in the state? Um, we do have some fallout with exhibitors. We do have some uh, concerns with getting all of the volunteers there, but we're piecing all that data together and we'll come to as informed a decision as we can uh, in the early May timeframe. And, and May, we're saying maybe because at that point, you start really committing a lot of financial resources to the event. And, and we have also fiduciary responsibility to protect the association for it. For the, its ongoing life. Um, so that answers, I mean, that, that actually answers one of the questions that a lot of people have, which is, I think, for a lot of people that are certainly hoping that 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 that, that in, in any form that it still happens, how, how late you can kind of push it out, um, your decision making, because everybody's always hoping that uh, a little more time would, yeah, mean, I, would mean a little, I, a little bit more. So I don't think anyone uh, is, is saying, you know, tell us now. I think people are wondering how late can you wait uh, so that you can say yes. Uh, that's the hope. It, it is, and it's it's. Um, even, I mean, I wish we could go later in the day. I really do because I think we're going to know a lot more as we get closer. Um, it, it gets to be every week is a very telling week. May though starts to get into the kind of the point of no return where you're really committing lots and lots of resources, both financially and personally, and from commitments um, to where if you if you were to do that and you got stuck to where the state or the, the, the requirements from CDC and others were such you couldn't have it, it would be, it'd be really unfortunate financially. And we just don't want to 
risk our members' money in, in that way. Right. That makes sense. Well, uh, I, I guess uh, the, the the real question <laughs> then becomes, what exactly are you going to do if it doesn't happen uh, for uh, because of that, and uh, you still wind up with a whole bunch of people camping on their own on the, on the North Pole? <laughs> Well, it, it, see, this is part of the problem is even right now, the state continues to call us and say, there better not be anybody in your campgrounds. Um, so they're, they're watching and asking uh, to dis- just because of the orders that are in place currently. So, um, see, I'm not, know, I'm not exactly familiar with your orders versus orders here that we have uh, versus other, other country, uh, com- <laughs> um, sorry, counties uh, and states. But uh, so people are not even allowed to camp is what you're saying. No, um, in our facility, the, the campground is a special use only during your adventure. It's not a public campground year round unless you get a permit to open it. Got it. And I think the state with a, the state parks are all closed, essential workers only, that kind of activity. Um, the good news is that essential workers includes people to maintain your facilities and ensure that things are still okay. So we do have our facilities team still working on the grounds, keeping that going. Excellent. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't want those fingers crossed. And I mean, I wish we could not have to make the decision until July. Um, yeah. because that would at least give you a lot more time to, to hopefully get to where you need to go. Yeah. You know, uh, of the stories that we get coming in, one of them uh, uh, has to do with uh, home building during Air, Air Venture. And that includes things like what's going on here. And I think a lot of people are sitting there going, Hmm, all of a sudden, I'm making an awful lot of progress on my project. I might, I might actually make the show. <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, giving them a lot of time to do that. And and um, again, I, the, the obligation you have as a leader is you have to make sure you maintain the safety and integrity of your of your event so that mm-hmm. no one gets in any kind of harm's way. And our employees. I mean, that's uh, my commitment to them, which I communicate to them all the time about that. Is to uh, care about you guys we need to be here for the long run so we're gonna we're gonna be careful so with that in mind what are your what are your thoughts beyond this crisis for aviation there are a lot of challenges that we're going to be left with we're going to be left with uh some very serious economic challenges um uh challenges about how people view events challenges about all sorts of things And aviation, uh, general aviation in particular, has always been incredibly vulnerable um, to economic downturns from the 2007-2008 downturn to others. What are your, what kind of thoughts do you have about what what happens when this starts to blow blow over? What happens to our industry? Right now, and I, I, I spend an awful lot of time of every day in the last three weeks talking to other industry leaders, the CEOs, all the various companies we, we. We chat as to what are they doing and preparing for this, and and I would say most of them are feeling pretty um, resilient about the industry. You know, they're they're certainly completely down and depressed right now because of the suddenness of this this uh, attack on us that you never saw coming. It wasn't like the 08 meltdown, financial meltdown, but uh, most of them are saying the good news is that it may be a slow financial recovery, but it's not like the financial crisis when it occurred. Where were absolute, there were people that were financially wrecked. Um, mm-hmm. There's some setbacks, there's gonna be some 401ks, that are gonna, people are gonna have to work a little longer to get them back up to speed. Um, and people are gonna go back to work after this is, as it works its way through. Um, so I don't think there's gonna be permanent fallout. Uh, there might be ones and twos companies that don't survive, but uh, I think all in all, you know, this time next year, Right. There's no second waves. I think we'll see general aviation back to where it was probably the, three years ago, um, which was kind of the, the, the build up to what we had saw leading into this year with a booming airline industry, job market that was so hot you couldn't find enough employees for it. So that's going to have to work its, work its way through the system. So maybe a few years set back, but really nothing, nothing catastrophic for our industry. Oh, wait, one of the catastrophic pieces was there were people that were challenging the use of aviation saying it was a one percenters kind of kind of thing and that mm-hmm. created some some permanent changes in the industry i think with this the one thing we're seeing and in, in, in talking to some people today about it um the need for general aviation and the safety and security of of an act like a virus where um, you're actually better off being in a in a 172 going to see grandma than taking the airlines um certainly is going to cause a, a reason for it to continue to be to be relevant. I think it will continue to be extremely relevant, 
Um, and I think it's going to be still continue to be a great hobby and escape for us recreational guys that like to, that, you know, that's where we put our, our extra time and money into. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I really, really I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you joining us this evening on Social Flight Live and especially the inspiration of getting people out there and flying with within the restrictions and within safety that they have. The idea that, that you are doing it and that you're pulling out the steermen, I think, is inspirational. And um, it, it's just important that we keep our industry going not just economically, but psychologically. And it is so easy when you stay home for an extended period of time to forget what the power and majesty and beauty is of flying. And it just, it changes you. And, and it's it, with every flight. And I it think does. it's really important people do that. It does. And stay connected to your, your flying families. Keep them encouraged. Uh, tell them to keep the faith. It's, this too will pass and we'll all be back together again soon uh, as EA, as an EA family. So. Um, thank you again for having me on your on your program. You're very very welcome. I hope you'll come back again. And uh, thanks for your time. And we will uh, we'll switch I, over now. I will, but I got to ask you, which episode was it that had the disinfecting? That was our first uh, uh, episode that we had uh, that had that. And I, I will personally send you a link to that. It is on uh, our YouTube. All of our uh, uh, programs and uh, are out, out on YouTube. And uh, that has that information. I can connect you with anything that you need. Some fantastic information about was, disinfecting aircraft by Mark Rubin at New England Aircraft Detailing. Excellent. Look forward to, to watching it. Excellent. Take care, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. So now I would like to uh, switch over uh, to our next guest for the evening. And uh, let me share this. Our next guest here is... Sorry, I just had to work out the uh, screen there. Mike Adamson, hopefully you can see this on your screen now. There we go. Mike Adamson, president of the Aircraft Electronics Association. And uh, let me uh, get uh, Mike to join us. So Mike uh, leads the AEA from its international headquarters in Lee's Summit, Missouri, which represents nearly 1,300 member companies in over 40 countries. As a military veteran from the Navy, um, Mike has worked with uh, uh, Fortune 100 companies, uh, has uh, served on ASTM F-46 for aerospace personnel, F-38 unmanned uh, aircraft systems, and is a founding board member of the National Center for Aerospace and Transportation Technologies. Mike, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So, what I'd like to do is talk about the industry itself. Now, now you and I share a common history of working in the avionics industry. Um, right. uh, uh, both of us actually spending time at, at Honeywell at one point. Um, and I think, you know, the avionics industry is certainly a bellwether of what's happening. It moves in some cases the fastest. Um, a lot of things are happening there. And um, we went into this crisis with um, an interesting situation where there was such a backlog be, due to ADSB technology and other things that the industry was churning and really, I think, pretty far beyond its capacity to, to handle the work was coming in. And now, of course, that puts them in a little bit of a different situation. What are you hearing both from, on one end, the shops, is the other end from the industry? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks thanks again for having us tonight and, and uh, the ability to talk about our, our shops, those valued uh, businesses. They're, they're such a big part of this industry, the GA and, and, and business aviation industry. Um, you know, that was an interesting thing. We went from absolute peak and record year uh, in 2019 and um, what, 12 straight quarters of record sales for equipment. Uh, that we reported and just, just you know, um, the tightest labor market we've ever ever experienced, um, uh, a need for technicians, you know, backlogs at our shops, uh, those kinds of things. So fast forward, you know, what, up until the middle of March or the first part of March, uh, we, were, we were on record highs for everything. Um, and even our association, we were looking forward. Uh, we were in the same shoe that... Uh, uh, the same shoes that Jack's in with uh, our convention. We're looking forward to our big show coming up in Nashville, and um, we were excited about that. Um, you know, a month a month later, here we are in completely uncharted territory. Uh, we've canceled our show, and um, you know, and our shops are are you know those small businesses that are 
trying to figure out, you know, what the future looks like for them. Um, a lot of them, are, I've talked to a number of them uh, since we canceled, and um, a lot of them are working off of their backlogs, uh, so they still have business for the coming weeks. Um, but uh, you know, it's not it's not like the phones are ringing like they were in the end of 2019. Right now, I think it's important to point out one of the things uh, that that we were actually discussing before the show that when we when you look at safe practices, when you think about social distancing and everything that companies are facing uh, during this crisis, what's uniquely interesting about our industry of aircraft maintenance and including, of course, uh, the avionics shops is that if, if you go back in time six months before anyone knew you know, what COVID-19 was and you went into one of these shops, what you would generally see were going to be technicians working uh, independently, isolated from one another, separated by at least 25, 30 feet between different aircraft, wearing gloves. I mean, this is an industry that's already set for safe practices. They've been doing this for years. About the only thing that needs to change for some of them in order to maintain that safety and still do their job is probably the break room. Exactly. I mean, you said it. We're we're built for this, right? And it's funny when I was talking to one of the shops out in Colorado, and I was kind of getting you know status check of what what their backlog looks like, and you know what they're expecting with uh, with their labor force. That's a question. You know, how much do they need, and and how are they doing the workflow, and and you know bringing people um, and customers in and out of the shop. And and it was funny. Um, you know, the general manager said, Look, "We're built for this. This is this is what my technicians love. They love to go to an aircraft um, by themselves." And focus on it for an entire day, and it can be across the hangar from another one, and you know there's no issue with uh, with anything as far as um, you know. It certainly meets the social distancing requirements for sure. Um, you know, and repair stations themselves are inherently you know safety focused. That's you know that's our makeup. We we adhere to um, safety management principles that you know, like you said, this is stuff we were practicing for a number of years. So um, this is standard procedure for us. Um, for a lot of our shops, um, so they're you know they're determined to be essential. They're open for business. Um, you're probably going to experience some new aircraft uh, aircraft departure and drop off and, and delivery procedures. Um, customer interaction, maybe a closed um, pilot shop in front uh, of the of the business, but you know they're they're resorting to to online sales and that sort of thing, um, and they're able to maintain and, and upgrade and service your aircraft. And, and I think it's important to point out that that maintenance uh, still has to happen. You know, you still need your two-year check for I, to, if, for your IFR, for your transponder, for your altimeter. Um, all this stuff still needs to happen um, if that aircraft's going to keep flying. And I think having our aircraft available to us as well as the pilots is important, not even just to ourselves, but to society. Uh, aviation has served so many times as a backstop to being able to help deliver supplies. When we had Mark Hansen on uh, as our guest last week, one of the things that he talked about was the efforts going on to deliver bone marrow samples using general aviation because you can't do it right now using couriers on the airlines. And supplies and masks and other things that are being delivered by people, obviously you can't deliver people safely right now, but being able to deliver supplies, that's, that's critical and it goes right into the heart of so many communities. Uh, by having their general aviation airport there instead of into the heart of a city uh, where uh, the, uh, the major hubs uh, go into. So I think it's really, really important that uh, people keep track of this and understand, I'm going to have to get my airplane in there to do it, and there's no reason not to do it. And I will say that uh, your uh, associate, uh, Rick Perry, Vice President of Governor, Governor, Government excuse me, Affairs uh, for the Aircraft Electronics Association, also mentioned that uh, uh, DHS has uh, um, said that currency for pilots is an essential function, and that covers all of us. So the idea of getting out there and flying is is essential. We need to do that. Right. We, you know, we certainly encourage it from the, the things that you and Jack were talking about. Um, just your own, you know, for your own recreation and your own spirit and to live your life and to continue to do it. But it does serve uh, a different purpose um, as well, and and that's the 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 caregiving side and the and the movement of, of critical uh, medical supplies and and organs and that sort of thing. So there's some things I think the general public may not be aware of in the value of general aviation. But um, you know we we focus 
primarily on on the recreational side and you know the use of the aircraft for for fun and for for uh, vacations and exploration and that sort of thing uh, those things are all allowed um, and, and can be done safely um, maybe you change a little bit of your procedures and how you do it but you know, you can, we still we still can do it and we encourage it um, yeah. so you know and you, what you might find with some of these repair stations is depending on their clientele and, and their financial situation you might see some some opening um, slots to get in and get service that you might not have seen otherwise or even get a better deal on having something installed I mean who knows well you know there's that's true and our manufacturers have stepped up too I mean that's something that you got to think about the, the equipment manufacturers um, that are part of our association are, are coming out with with all kinds of support um, you know deals on equipment and that sort of thing so they're obviously pressing on as well but at the same time these companies are are also pivoting um, because they're able to manufacture, they're supporting the caregivers and the frontline workers um, with masks and gowns and and um, and that sort of thing uh, to support them. So, you know, they're doing both, and they should be recognized for that. Let, let's talk about the the industry players for a minute. There, um, obviously, in addition to the shops, the other half of of who you you support and work with are the manufacturers. Um, how are they doing? right now what are you seeing in across the spectrum of what you're hearing from avionics companies themselves and how they're surviving uh this the crisis well certainly i think you'll see you know there's a dip in sales i mean i think that's an obvious thing and it varies for all of them um and you know and some of that's held pretty close to the vest as far as those numbers um, but i think they would admit that and that's probably an obvious statement um that being said they're offering incentives um, they are still, you know, working off backlogs, so they're still supplying our shops with equipment. Um, and as I mentioned, some of them are finding opportunity in in pivoting and supporting frontline workers. Um, it depends, you know. We've got uh, manufacturers of all sizes, um, you know, that, that support, um, you know, the smallest uh, equipment, um, peripheral equipment for an aircraft, up to major major systems in the cabin and the cockpit. So um, you can't speak for all of them uh, broadly. Uh, but I do know that uh, you know they're they're looking at ways um, to build up for essentially what's probably going to be a better you know third quarter and and fourth quarter. We're we're kind of hoping it's a coiled spring as as I've heard it referred to. So yeah, it's the case. Excellent. Um, well, uh, anything else to add that uh, about what's kind of happening in the industry or any of the work that you're doing with different organizations or or thoughts to help? Well, it's funny you mentioned the you know all the work that was going on before this this crisis um you know we had the workforce development pieces we were working on we worked very closely with uh with eaa and, and we support kid venture every year we're up there uh with our own booth at the amp hangar and and uh, we were doing our own outreach and scholarship programs and and all the things that that um we will continue to do of course but um those those have kind of taken a back seat while we focus on the resources for our members worldwide it's not just a, a problem in the u.s this is a problem in every country, all 41 countries that we represent. Um, so we spent the last couple of weeks after we sort of unwound our show, um, sort of focusing on the resources that, that our small businesses need. Um, after we kind of went through determining that they were essential um, and could remain open and, and figured out how to manage their, their workforce and, and their customers, um, you know, we started focusing on what support do they have from the government? And, and those different programs. And we've kind of gone through that in the last couple of weeks uh, with the paycheck protection things and, and the disaster loan uh, offerings. Um, and so now you've kind of seen this evolution as they've gone through this um, phase where they've wondered if they were gonna get to do business right. or, or getting to do that business. Um, and it looks like they'll, they'll be able to weather the storm if, if we do start to recover here you know, in the near future. Um, you know, they're looking at opportunities going forward. Um, so they're getting back to those things that are important for repair stations. Of course, they're servicing aircraft and installing uh, equipment, but um, it's also a time like uh, a lot of folks are doing. They're looking at um, things around the house. Well, they're looking at things around the hangar that they can focus on. And, right. and our shops, um, you know, are, are, are the best trained. Uh, that's, you know, that's my history with the organization was the training piece uh, for the last 20 years. And I can attest to uh, the level of training that these technicians and repair stations put themselves through to stay current with all the latest products, all the regulatory uh, uh, information that Rick provides. Um, they're just nonstop training. So these manufacturers, while they're, while they're pivoting to do other things, they're supporting our shops with tremendous webinars, um, 
uh, you know, support from the product support side. Um, they're looking to the association. We're starting a webinar series in addition to the resources we've put online. Um, we do classes at our headquarters. Uh, we have had to push those back where we're doing some hands-on training. Um, mm -hmm. so we're pushing those back to August for now. Um, but uh, we plan to get back to that when we can get, you know, small groups that, that can gather again. Uh, we look forward to getting back in the groove uh, with, with that. So they're focusing on training, they're fo focusing on their operations, um, and then looking ahead to filling that backlog again if, if they're able to do that. Yeah, and I think it's important both uh, on both ends of that spectrum. Again, uh, you know, if, if you're someone out there that is has an aircraft and is thinking about upgrading or certain, you know, get get something booked on there. Uh, get make sure that these shops understand what the consistency is going to be. The idea of when you make your decision, even if it's a position that you can can still cancel, may make the difference between whether or not a shop decides to keep their personnel on uh, about what's happening. I think it's really important that people look forward, that they maintain their aircraft, that they stay uh, not just current themselves, but the aircraft stays current, and if you're if you're going to at some point invest, we're going to come out the other side of this. Like there's no question about that. And when that happens, um, this is the opportunity to have gotten a good deal on some equipment to make make a plan for uh, upgrading your panel and and do something that that you you can't go back and and uh, get the same deal in the past. I can honestly say that um, you know we got our uh, A36 Bonanza right uh, around the financial crisis time. It was not something that was financially possible for us before that became possible and became possible to be able to go and improve on it as well at the time. Um, this is a similar opportunity. There's a lot of things that people can do, not to take advantage, but to support the industry. And so I really do think it's important. Yeah, you'd mentioned uh, in your conversation with Jack, you know, sort of the cycles that we're familiar with. I think we talked about these before the show with 9-11, with and, and of course the, the financial crisis in seven and eight and, and the opportunities that follow um, are certainly there. And I think this, is, this has got a different makeup. This is something we haven't seen before, a worldwide shutdown in a sense, um, but we were so strong before. And, and I think there's a lot of people um, that are still trying to figure out a way um, to live their lives as, as normal as possible. And flying is an outlet, absolutely, besides the, Besides the you know the purpose that it provides for all the things we've talked about, it's an outlet and and um, you know given an opportunity uh, where there may be a discount or maybe an open slot at a repair station, um, there's going to be some people that take advantage of that and um, you know look back and think that was a real opportunity for them. Um, so that there's some silver lining for sure. Absolutely. Well, Mike Hampson, president of the Aircraft Electronics Association, thank you so much for taking your time out this evening. It's always great. I hope you'll join us again. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks we'll for having me. on the other side of this, and, and we'll be talking about uh, the uh, getting your show back and, and everything else that keeps moving. Um, you know, uh, I think it, it, the inspiration is wonderful, and I really, really appreciate the update. Absolutely. Thanks for the time, and stay safe. Stay well. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. So I'd like to take the opportunity now to um, – uh, to go and take a, a little treat we try to do at the uh, at the end of all of our shows, and that's to take a look at this project going on behind me here, which is Social Flight's T-51D Mustang. And so um, what I'm going to do now is uh, I'll switch over here. I'll show you first what we've got uh, as uh, some uh, quick pictures. If you can follow both us and our T-51D Mustang build, uh, at on YouTube, just looking at Social Flight, and also on Instagram at Social Flight app, or YouTube as it shows right there. So um, lots of ways that you can stay in touch with us. And uh, I will tell you, we're really known for uh, sending out T-shirts to people who, who correspond with us. Uh, uh, there's always prize giveaways. There's a million things going on. It's a fun place to be. And I will tell you that if you are going to be um, kind of uh, self-isolated and, and uh, shelter in place. Doing it where you've got this guy in your home and these two boys you're about to see helping build a, a, an aircraft is, um, is, is, it takes a little bit of the pain away. So um, what I'd like to do now is hand it over. Um, Jake and Ben are gonna take a look at some work that's been done. Jake just did a project uh, that is helping uh, finish off how we're gonna have the heating and cooling system on the aircraft. And so um, 
let's uh, see if we can get that camera started. Started. <laughs> started. Wait for the camera, guys. Are we good? Camera's not on. Mike is on the camera. Just give us one minute. We're getting the camera turned on. Okay, you're on. Okay, so um, this is our cockpit of our T-51 Mustang that we're building. Um, it's something that's uh, very, very cool, very cool experience for us to be able to do. And um, one thing that I think that I've actually benefited from from the coronavirus was my ability to um, work on the plane basically every single day. And it's been uh, so cool to every day pick out a new um, little project to work on and go design, go um, uh, manufacture it. And it's been so cool to be able to reach out to the people who are also helping the industry and um, kind of make the best thing that we can. So something that I'm going to be talking about and we touched on on it um, before is our heating and cooling system. And that's something that um, I think is very important to us just to be able to uh, create the climate that we want to inside the cockpit. So uh, just a brief overview of how we're going to do that. We have a, um, a heating coil and a fan um, which takes the coolant from our engine, runs it through to heat up the air, and then we have a mixing box, which will mix that hot air with the ram air coming from the top of the cowl. Um, and so with that mixing box, we need a place to control it. We need a place to both control that mixing box as well as the fan um, for our heating. And so that's what I took on starting last night, and I basically was able to finish it today. So briefly looking at it, I started with just some little plans um, just on a scrap piece of paper and it kind of just took off to life. This was literally last night and I was able to um, take the time that I had and um, kind of get the most out of it. So as you can see on the lower panel in black, that is the um, uh, control panel that we have. We have the fan for the heating system. So off, low, and goes all the way to high. And then we have two um, valves which control the top one controls our uh, mixing valve so that will control the mixing box that um, mixes our hot air from the uh, heating box to the cold ram air. Then we also have a control on the bottom and that will control the heat coming straight from that heating box right to our feet. So in the colder months, which we're trying to uh, fly this all year round, we're able to get that heating. And um, so yeah, it's been a very cool experience. I've learned a ton basically we switched our metal around a couple different times of what metal was going to bend the best for us. We went to a local shop just to uh, briefly talk to them, and um, I was able to really understand why you would choose one metal over the other or how far um, you make your setback for turning um, and bending a piece of metal. And it's been uh, just this one little experience from starting last night to tonight. Um, I've been able to completely changed my perspective on how I'm going to approach a project in the future. And it's something that um, hopefully I can keep doing next week. We'll do another um, update on what we're going to do. And hopefully I can take the things that I learned here and apply them to something else that you can see next week. All right. Let me... Uh... Oops, yes, there we go. Had to switch everything back. And so uh, just a nice quick little peek into uh, what's going on in that aspect of the T-51 Mustang build. It's, uh, it, it's, it is so cool, of course, obviously proud dad here to be able to see um, uh, all this knowledge going on that can be applied to so many different parts of life after this. And so, as Jake mentioned, he learned about layouts and how you prototype a part. And had, we learned some different issues of, of bending and, and a lot of things that whether you wind up 
going into a field that you use it or not, I think are really helpful in life. And um, this is, uh, it, I'll tell you, three heads are better than one. And uh, the idea that, that I had originally had for how we were going to control the heating system on the aircraft involved it in the center pedestal, um, involved it in, in, in like putting things differently between where the control was for the, the uh, power for the fan. And it was the boys that actually came and said, you know, that really isn't going to work. You know, that's in the way of the of the control stick. And Jake came up with this idea of where it was going to go in that upper right hand corner and have it set back a little bit. We worked on the different ways that uh, uh, the cables can be arranged. And we talked a lot about things that have to do with human factors, like should a control that you push in or pull out, which should be the on state, which should be the normal state that it's in. And so a lot of really interesting learning goes on anytime someone gets exposed to building an aircraft. And so even if this isn't something that, that uh, anyone is fortunate enough to be able to do themselves, um, I would encourage everyone to watch the videos and expose children to it and other uh, people so that they can understand um, all these different aspects of how to make an airplane fly and how it gets built. And that things like this, like kind of almost absurdity of uh, having a T-51 Mustang here in our living room, um, are possible and can uh, bring a little bit of joy uh, during a time like this. And so thanks, of course, to everyone who joined on the program uh, tonight, to Jack Pelton, to Mike Adamson, uh, to Jake and Ben working on the airplane behind me. Really do appreciate it. Please go to socialflight.com and the Social Flight mobile app and subscribe. Make sure that you join there. It is completely free. It will make sure that you get informed of all of the webinars that are happening everywhere, um, all events when the crisis is over to attend to, and you can click on one button on the map page and also be able to get the uh, burger icon that shows all your airport restaurants. That and so, so much more all available on Social Flight. And we would not be here if it weren't for all of our partners. And so please also through Social Flight, you will see all of them. Please visit them as well. Until next time, I'm Jeff Simon from Social Flight. Blue skies. <laughs>